Greetings and welcome to our cyber worship with Antioch Baptist Church. For Antioch, this is a season of new transition as we go into another season of our 127 year legacy. We're so thankful and grateful to God for seeing fit to provide us with an under shepherd in the leadership of our pastor emeritus, Reverend Dr. Marvin A. Matt Mickle, who will serve as our interim pastor. During the season of social distancing, the church doors may be closed, but the real church continues to thrive and we're still praising, praying, giving testimony, service, and worshiping as we worship God with our very lives day to day. Thank you for joining us for this worship experience and it is our prayer that you will be uplifted, encouraged, and we thank you for spending your time with us today. Now we will hear a prophetic word from the Lord, and we pray that you will be blessed. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, find the glory. Good evening, I'm Reverend Thomas Gilmore. I'd like to welcome you to the second night of our virtual revival at Antioch Baptist Church. Uh, it has been six months since we've been able to come together uh, in our congregation to meet in our sanctuary, to fellowship together, to worship together. But we thank God for the technology that God has provided that through virtual meeting, through virtual worship, we're able to still stay connected. It's so important for us to stay connected to one another, stay connected to family, stay connected to God. And what better time than to have a revival to stay connected to our community and to those who love God. And so we invite you to join us uh, to get your, gather your family together in your living room, in your kitchen, in your dining room, to gather them together around your computer, around your tablet, around your phone. And so that you might worship together, we might worship together in the community, and that God might revive a new and bring a new spirit with us during this time of need. Uh, if you would join me in a time of prayer, Eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship together, uh, even if we have to do it remotely. We thank you, Lord, for the technology provided, the highway, the information highway, Lord, that 
we might still be connected. We thank you, Lord, for all those who are gathered together today that you might revive us, you might renew us, you might give us a, a newness of your spirit, that you might be present in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We expect you to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ever think or ask. And so we pray, Lord, that your word might come with power and demonstration, that it might affect your people in such a way that we'll be crying, what can we do that we might be able to share this gospel and this good news with someone else. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And we bless you in Jesus' precious name. And all of God's children said, amen. Late in the evening, late in the evening, I'm going home to live on high. Oh, soon as my feet strike Zion, lay down my heavy burden, put on Tell my story. I've been climbing up hills and mountains. I'm going to drink from that Christian fountain. You know, all God's sons and daughters that morning will be drinking that old healing water. Gonna live on forever. We gonna live on forever. We gonna live on up in glory. After a while, you know what I'm gonna do. I'm going sightseeing up in Beulah. Our theme for this week is taken from Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, verses 18 through 19. Our theme is God is doing a new thing. And the text tells us, reading from the New International Version, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This is the word of the Lord. We pray that it might be placed upon your heart in such a way that it might renew your spirit and excite you about what God is doing in times like this. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Yes. 
great pleasure at this time to introduce our speaker for the night. We have already heard a, a resounding word from Reverend uh, Otis Moss III. Uh, we now have the privilege of hearing from a new speaker who is new to Cleveland, Ohio. It is my pleasure as the former interim pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church to introduce to you the new senior pastor of the historic Shiloh Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. The Reverend Dr. Lisa Maxine Goods currently serves as the, new, as the first female in the 170 year history of this church. Uh, she comes to us as a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Reverend Goods holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Finance from Penn State University. She has a Master of Divinity degree from McCormick Theological Seminary, a Doctor of Ministry from Chicago Theological Seminary, and is currently pursuing a PhD in African American Preaching and Sacred Rhetoric at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana. Reverend Goods was a recipient of the Jess, Jess Hasley Award for Imagination in Preaching and was a two-time award winner of the seminary's highest award in preaching, the James Taylor Award at McCormick Theological Seminary. She has published in the African American Pulpit in their 2017 Top Seminaries Edition. She was ordained in the United Church of Christ. Reverend Good serves for 11 years as the Associate Pastor of Outreach and Communications at Covenant United Church of Christ in South Holland, Illinois. And she also served as Senior Pastor of Kenwood United Church of Christ in Chicago. Reverend Goods is the daughter of Cassandra Jones and the late Richard Goods, Sr., and is the mother of one son, Julian James Goods. It's my pleasure to welcome her to Cleveland, Ohio. And my word to her, as we would say to all that come before us, preach the word. And I pray that you might receive a word from Dr. Goods that might inspire you, might motivate you to know that God is still in control, God is sovereign, and he has a word for us today through Dr. Goods. After hearing the next musical selection, the next words you will hear will be from Dr. Lisa Goods. Hear ye her. Good evening, Antioch. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you this evening. I bring you greetings from the Shiloh Baptist Church where we are making disciples who make a difference to your pastor emeritus and interim pastor, the esteemed Reverend Dr. Marvin McMickle, whom I have followed from afar for many years. Sir, it is indeed an honor to virtually share your pulpit and I am so looking forward to our continued fellowship here in the city of Cleveland. To the Reverend Millian Waite, thank you so much, my sister, for your gracious invitation. To my sisters and brothers of the Cleveland Baptist Association, thank you for your warm welcome as I made my transition here to Cleveland. And finally, to all of my family and friends and followers who so graciously support my ministry and follow me, whether I am preaching physically or virtually, your love and support means much to me. And so it is preaching time and the text for tonight comes from 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses seven through nine. I will be reading from the New International Version. 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses seven through nine. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Would you pray with me on the subject, power in the midst of the storm? Let us pray. Dear God, it is the preaching moment, and I cannot preach unless you preach through me. I cannot teach unless you teach through me. And so, God, I ask that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Consecrate the space between my lips and the hearer's ear. Break up the 
fallow ground in the hearts of your people, that your words might take root, that we might each leave this place different than we came in. Do what you and you alone can do. Have your way, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, I ask that you pray with me on the subject, power in the midst of the storm. Your theme this week is God is doing a new thing, talking about the new things that God is doing in this very unprecedented time in which we live. And my brothers and my sisters, I would submit to you that any time there is a newness introduced into the atmosphere, it sets the stage for storms to occur. When the new intersects with the old, storms erupt. A storm, by definition, is any disturbed state of a body, especially affecting its surface and strongly implying a wind force. Storms may be marked by significant disturbances of lightning, thunder, heavy precipitation, freezing rain, strong winds. There are rainstorms, dust storms, snow storms, ice storms. Storms are created when a center of low pressure is surrounded by a center of high pressure. The intersection of these opposing forces creates pressure developing the turbulence that we know as a storm. Storms can be powerful, destructive, frightening, even deadly acts of nature. And while some people enjoy sitting through a good thunderstorm, I do not like storms. As a child, when there was a storm, my grandmother would make us move away from the windows and doors and sit quietly until the storm had passed over. And once, more than once in our neighborhood, a home was struck by lightning. So I grew up with an aversion to storms. Yet weather emergencies are not the only type of storms. Some of the most devastating storms are not weather related at all. These are the storms of life, the storms that come from the vicissitudes of daily life. When the forces of the center of low pressure in your life suddenly become surrounded by high pressure, creating a seismic turbulent force resulting in proverbial wind, rain, thunder, lightning, lightning and utter chaos in your life. A storm. Storms happen when a lump is found in the breasts of an otherwise healthy and vibrant woman. Storms happen when a job decides your services are no longer needed and your primary source of income suddenly disappears, leaving you wondering how you will pay your bills, keep food on the table, or provide basic health care for yourself and your family. Storms come when a spouse walks out on a marriage, leaving you feeling like you were not enough. Storms come when age sets in and you can no longer do the things you used to do and sometimes you can no longer care for yourself. We all go through storms. And collectively, we have been in a storm since January 2020, when the coronavirus was first detected. We have been in a storm of misinformation with our administration disseminating conflicting messages that defy science and even common sense. We have been in a storm as people are told to take drugs not proven to treat the virus, to drink Clorox, or that a vaccine will be available just days before the presidential election. We have been in a storm as businesses close and people demand that economies open up and refuse to wear masks even as over 200,000 American lives have been taken by the coronavirus. We have been in a storm. We are in a storm as black bodies continue to be lynched at the hands of those sworn to protect and serve. We are in a storm as we watch empowered racists lynch unarmed black bodies on camera with knees on their necks and bullets in their backs. We are in a storm when peaceful protesters are arrested, tear gassed, and shot at with rubber bullets 
while proclaiming Black Lives Matter, yet white protesters demanding the economy be opened up can storm a governor's mansion armed with assault weapons without arrest. We are living in a storm when there is more value placed upon the drywall damaged by the bullets of reckless renegade officers than the life of a 26-year-old first responder killed by those same bullets while resting in her own home. We are living in a storm when a presidential debate looks more like a schoolyard brawl and our commander-in-chief fails to denounce white supremacy but instead gives white supremacists their marching orders. We are living in a storm. We have storms in every aspect of life. In fact, it has been said that you are either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or headed for a storm. And when you are in a storm, it's hard to see your way. The rain can be so hard that you can hardly see the road. Your windows begin to fog up. You turn on your high beams. The wind blows your car to and fro as you grip the steering wheel harder and harder, trying to guide yourself and your car to safety. Eventually, the power goes out and you can't see what is even in front of you. And while we know that at the end of many storms there is a beautiful rainbow, it's hard to think about that when you are in the middle of a storm. But in this text from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul teaches us that we can have power in the midst of the storm. And I just want to encourage you that you can still have power in the midst of your storm. God told me to tell you that storms are an, an inevitable part of life. But God will give you power in the midst of your storm. Not as you go through after your storm, but right in the middle of your storm. Do I have any witnesses that God will give you power in the midst of your storm? You see, our text comes from the Apostle Paul. Paul was one who knew something about weathering a storm. Paul was known as one born out of due season. He wasn't one of the original disciples. Paul was one who was born out of due season. Paul, whose birth name was Saul, was a very learned man speaking both Hebrew and Greek. He was a staunch Jew, proficient in the law. He made his mission to persecute early Christians because he thought that this Jesus movement was heresy. He thought it was sacrilegious. He was there at the stoning of Stephen, one of the first deacons, yet when the light and the voice of Jesus fell upon him on the Damascus road, Paul becomes one of the most avid and prolific preachers of the gospel. And the powerful and sometimes prophetic nature of his preaching placed him in the midst of a storm. The one who once taught the law now preached grace. The one who once denied Jesus now professed Jesus. The one who once persecuted Christians now became the persecuted Christian. His Damascus Road experience and preaching had taken him from the moral majority to the disenfranchised minority. On several occasions, Paul was beaten, sometimes nearly to death. Paul was falsely imprisoned for daring to speak truth to power. And, uh, and scholar Jerome O'Connor tells us that this city, that this text is in Corinth, was this fiercely competitive commercial city where capital gain was the one true God. It sounds familiar. Hence, it became a society that had no middle class, having only haves and have-nots. And in his decision to follow Christ, Paul had gone from being a have to being a have-not. So by the time we reach this text, Paul, like many of us, is singing, I have been in the storm too long. Yet despite all that he has gone through, Paul still has hope. In verse 8, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not destroyed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul says, I have been in the storm too long. It's been rough, but I still have hope. Paul has hope and his letter of battered hopefulness is a message for you and I today on how to weather the storm, but come out victorious.
victoriously, having power in the midst of the storm. Somebody ought to tell your neighbor or shout right when in your living room, neighbor, you can have power in the midst of the storm. And see, I know some of you are saying, preacher, that sounds good, but I just don't have that kind of faith. Faith, this storm that I am going through is too much. I am not okay. I feel like I am at the end of my rope. I feel crushed, forsaken, and destroyed. But God says the extraordinary power of God resides in ordinary vessels. Look at the text, but we have this treasure in jars of clay so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are jars of clay. We are ordinary jars of clay. When God made humankind, God made us from the dust of the earth, the clay. From dust we have come, and to dust we shall return. Clay vessels were common in this time, particularly in Corinth. Clay vessels were ordinary. Even the poor folks could have clay vessels. The rich had vessels made of precious metals. But clay vessels were fragile. They could break easily. It was common to find broken pieces or pot shares anywhere. Clay vessels were almost disposable. And so Paul compares our human frailties to these fragile clay vessels. We are fragile jars of clay. We are made in God's image and likeness. So then we are vessels created to house God's spirit and God's power. That's why Paul says we have this treasure in jars of clay. What is this treasure? It is that extraordinary power of God. And can I let you in on a secret? All your life you've been looking outside yourself for power. Power to fix your situation. Power to make you whole. Power to heal your brokenness. But God said the power is already inside of you. God says I placed my power inside of you when I created you in my image. And so my first point is, if you want to have power in the midst of your storm, you have got to realize that the power is already in you. And, and some of you have been looking for power in all the wrong places. You heard about the power of wealth, so you thought if you got enough money, that would fix your brokenness, but money didn't end your storm. You heard about the power of medicine, but that didn't end your dis-ease. You heard Luther sing about the power of love, so you sought out that man or that woman to complete you, not realizing that you were already complete because God had already put the power inside of you. God has given us power in the midst of the storm because God's extraordinary power resides in these ordinary vessels. Even in weak, trodden down, cracked, or broken vessels, the power is already inside of you. And if we want to survive these storms of injustice, hatred, and immorality, we have got to access God's extraordinary power that is in each of us. God's extraordinary power is already in us. The other thing this text teaches us is that it is okay to not be okay. It's okay to admit that you're not okay with what's going on in your life. It's okay to admit that you're not okay with what's going on around you. It's okay that you're not okay with what's going on in our world, living in a triple pandemic of coronavirus, racism, and presidential incompetence. It's okay to not be okay. But you see, the thing is, many of us like to walk around like we have got it all together because we've got titles in front of our names, letters behind our names, and a fat bank account with our name on it. We act like we are okay. Others of us like to act like we are so hard, we are so big, so bad, so hard that nobody or nothing can touch us. You see, we wear the mask to do more than prevent the spread. We wear masks to hide what's really going on inside, trying to mask the hurt, the pain, the anxiety, the fear, and the hopelessness brought on by our storm. We wear a mask trying to hide the fact that we are broken clay vessels. But the songwriter said, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. Somebody else said, why are you trying to figure it out? God's already worked 
it out. You just have to say that you are not okay and ask for help. For Jesus said, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. Jesus says it's okay not to be okay. Yes, and Paul says, I, 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 am a great, I know I'm a great preacher. I have founded many churches. I have great faith, but God, I'm not okay right now. I feel like I'm pressed. I feel like the walls are closing in on me. I feel crushed like the weight of this world is on my shoulders. I feel perplexed. I don't understand what's going on. I feel persecuted. People are accusing me of things that I didn't do and twisting the words that I have tried to do for you and the kingdom. Paul says, God, this thing is hard. He says, it's hard. This prophetic stuff is hard. This justice work is hard. And that is all God is waiting on us to do, to admit that this journey is hard and we cannot make it by ourselves. We must admit we have a problem and we need God's help to fix our problem. We need God's power in the midst of our storm. But the good news in this text and the final thing that this text is tailored to teach us this evening is that you have to realize the power of God's butt. You've got to recognize the power of God's butt. Somebody say there's power in God's butt. So, so let me help you with this thing real quick. See, when I was a kid growing up on Saturday mornings, before the cartoons or between the cartoons, they had this thing called Schoolhouse Rock. Schoolhouse Rock took subjects like math, science, social studies, and English and put them to catchy beats and songs that kids could remember. One of my favorite Schoolhouse Rocks was Conjunction Junction, What's Your Function? Hooking up words and phrases and sentences. Schoolhouse Rock taught me that a conjunction connects two phrases together and but is a conjunction. But the cool thing about but is not only does it connect two phrases, but it changes everything that came before it. And somebody ought to be shouting in their living room right now because we ain't talking about English anymore, And but God's but has the power to wipe out everything that came before in your life. God's butt has the power to change everything that is going on in your life. Paul says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And I just came by to let somebody know this evening that if you want to have power in the midst of your storm, you need to learn the, to recognize the power of God's butt. My Angelou said, you may write me down in history with your bitter, bitter twisted lies. You may try me in the very dirt, but still like dust I rise. They said we were three-fifths of a person, but God said we were created in the image and likeness of God, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, I could have been homeless. I could have been strung out. I could have been left out, but by the grace of God, there go I. I could have been dead, sleeping in my grave, but God made all death behave. I could have been dead, I could have been lost, I could have been lonely, but by the grace of God, I am still here. I once was young, but now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Even the youth get weary and faint, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, somebody said the doctor said had given up hope on you, but God. Somebody said you weren't going to make it, but God. Somebody said you weren't going to amount to anything, but God. Somebody said you weren't pretty enough, but God. Somebody said you weren't rich enough, but God. Somebody said you weren't quiet, qualified enough, but God. You know what else they said? They said we'd never have a black man on the 
Supreme Court, but God sent Thurgood Marshall. They said we never had a black president, but God sent Barack Obama. They said we'd never have a black woman on the ticket, but God sent Kamala Harris. Does anybody have a but God in their spirit? See, there is an amazing, redeeming, transforming, soul-saving power in God's butt. And it's not because we are so great. It's not because we are so faithful. It's not because we've earned it. It's not because we deserve it. But it is because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked down and saw our messed up state and said, Father, prepare me a body. He came across 40 and two generations to take on your sins and mine, but he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. They hung him high, they stretched him wide, he hung his head, and then he died, but that's not how the story ends, because in three days, he rose again. He, they said he hung there all day Friday, all day Saturday, but early Sunday morning, he rose with all power in his hands, that's the power of God's butt, the power to cancel out everything that came before us. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Do I have any witnesses to the power of God's butt? Does anybody have a butt in their spirit? Can anybody shout hallelujah for the butt of God? But God, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? There is power in God's butt. And you can have power in the midst of your storm. This is the word of God for the people of God. Somebody say, thanks be to God. Amen. We offer Christ to you.
It's been an exciting two nights. We've heard from two great preachers. And I know the word, when we hear a word from the God, there must be a response. We must not just be hearers of the word, we must also be doers of the word. And so I invite you to, if God has inspired you to, to make a decision, to join the family of God, to join the Anak Baptist Church, to join the Christian family, that you will make a decision for Christ today. I'm amazed that God loved us so much that he gave his very best, that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, that died for us on the cross, gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life in his name. There is so much about Christ written in the word of God. And the book of uh, John says that so much is written that was not written, but these were written that you might believe that he is the Christ, the son of God, and in believing you might have life in his name. I invite you to, to join the Christian family by confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt receive newness of life. And so we invite you to, to join this family at Antioch Baptist Church. There's a number on the screen that you can call. We will be happy to assist you, to guide you, to lead you in this new walk in Christianity. We invite you to join, if not Antioch, join a church where you can walk in fellowship with Jesus Christ for he said he'd never leave us alone. And we want to walk together with you. And so if you make this confession of faith, we invite you and, and welcome you into this, this family and pray that you might continue in days to come to continue to, to join us in fellowship, in worship, in Sunday school, and all the things we have to offer. We thank you for this participation. Again, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, we invite you to again join your family, gather around the screen, and have a virtual worship service with Antioch Baptist Church. If you can't do it tomorrow because it's a virtual service, pick any time of the week that you will join your family together and hear a word from God. And so as we end this service tonight, but not the fellowship, we pray that God might bless you and keep you, and we provide this benediction for you until we meet again tomorrow. And so now, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord shine upon you. May his grace always be with you. May he continue to walk with you and give you his peace. We thank you for joining us. We pray that God's blessings will forever be with you until we meet again. In Jesus' name we do pray. And all of God's children said, As you go. able to join us virtually for Sunday morning worship. At Antioch, we would like for you to know that Sunday worship is but one part of our ministry here. There are various ministries that attend to the needs of our community, and you can participate with us. You can do so by supporting our ministries through prayer, as well as through your financial stewardship. You may give through the app Givelify, as well as on our website for PayPal. You may also mail in any contribution to Antioch Baptist Church, 8869 Cedar Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio, 44106. We thank you for participating with us in the upbuilding of God's kingdom. God bless you.